Okay, so how does the genie work? Well, if you've seen an example, which is OEP1, OEP9, right? So take the ASCII codes of your string, add them together, reduce that modulo 13. You're going to get a number from 0 to 12. And it's going to be a unique number based on the characters. And in the examples that I gave you to test your code on, you notice that ABC and ACB and BCA all hash for the same value. Because if all you're doing is adding the ASCII codes, the order doesn't matter. Right? A plus B plus C is the same as C plus A plus B. So right there, you're going to have a lot of different words any time you rearrange the order that all take you to the same index in your array. So you can do something fancier, like take each ASCII code, multiply by the position of that letter, and add those together. And now ABC and CBA will give you different values. But the fundamental problem is still there, which is generally if you're trying to hash 12 digit, 12 character words, right, you got 26 letters, you got 12 characters, that's 26 to the 12th possible words. And unless your array contains 26 to the 12th entries, you're going to have more than one thing pointing to the same spot somewhere. Right? If you took 215, that's just the pigeonhole principle. So inevitably, the size of our array that we're storing our data in is going to be a lot smaller than the size of all the things that we might store. And so we're going to have this, this collision issue where we have multiple things pointing to the same spot. The genie function itself can be as simple as adding ASCII codes, weighted position of ASCII codes. Um, there's a number of things we could do. If we wanted to hash C programs, we could just take the binary file, break it into 32-bit chunks, treat each of those as an integer, and just add those together. This is what a checksum does. This is what an MD5 hash is, right? When you have a piece of code you're going to download, you get something that says, here's the MD5 hash for this. It's a unique number that's associated to this thing that you're about to download. It takes all the contents of that file and turns it into this small 512 bit or whatever you're use, using, this, this signature of it. And certainly there are a lot more programs than there are 512 bit numbers. But the chances of two programs mapping to the same 512-bit code is very, very slim, because there's two to the 512 possible 512-bit codes. The possibility that a single transmission error or a collection of random transmission errors would corrupt your file but still cause it to map to that same 512 bits very, very slim. And the possibility that somebody would maliciously change the code to do something, but that that code would still map to the same 512-bit identifier is very slim. But there are a lot, probably an infinite number of programs that would map to exactly the same code. So if we've only got 13 of these, there's only so many places to store our words and we're going to have these collisions. Um, and the choice of this genie, this hash function, um, so this is hash. The choice of that is going to affect how good a job we do at avoiding collisions and so on. So before we talk about number two, which is, which is sort of how we deal with this, let's talk about hashes in more general terms. So imagine let's see. Imagine we want to store phone numbers associated with people's names. So let's make our array. some number of entries. We've got a hash function that takes a name and returns an integer equals index associated with the name. 
we do something in here. We add ASCII codes, et cetera, et cetera. That's not a working version of ODP 9, so I'll try it. So it does something. It takes a name and it somehow returns an index into this, this array. All right, so we can certainly use this to store names in an array. So you take Nick and let's say Nick maps to 2, and Izad maps to 5, and Tina maps to 1, and Carol maps to 37. Well, if I just want to store people's names, I could store a Nick right here, I could store Izad here, I could store Tina here, and so on. But what I want to do is I want to store phone numbers. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, where should Nick be stored? And it's going to give me a 2. And at index element 2, I'm going to store my phone number. And I'm going to say, where does these odd go to? Well, that goes to location 5. So at location 5, I'm going to store these odd phone number. And Tina maps to index 1. So at index location 1, I'm going to store Tina's number, and so on. Carol maps to 37, and so at that location, I'm going to store Carol's phone number. All right, what's going on here? Here's my data, my hash. And I'm storing a bunch of phone numbers in here. But I can access those phone numbers by name. I can say, I want Izad's phone number. I know it's stored somewhere in this table, but I don't know where. To figure out where it's stored, I use my hash function and I say hash the string he's odd, it gives me back a five, that's where he's odd's number is. So this is like, this combination of the hash function and this, this data, this is like an array that I can index with strings. Instead of indexing with zero, one, two, three, or some integer, I can index this with a name. The effect is, I can think of it as something like this. Give me element number Nick. Give me element number he's odd. So this in 224, we call this an associative array. between this and a regular generic 121 array? Yeah. Right, regular array you index only with integers and their sequential numbers. An associative array, we can take a string, like a person's name, and use that to access an element in this array. And the way we would implement this is basically take whatever this string is, run it through your hash function, use that as an index into the actual array, an integer index. So we have data associated with these keys, these indexes. Okay, it's not only a very powerful way to program, it's the way that most people think our brains work. Our memories tend to be associative. What was the name of that restaurant that I really liked the other day? You don't go through every memory in your head from beginning to end, right? And you probably don't have an alphabetized list of memories, and you search for, you know, restaurant that I ate at last week and it's in the bottom half of the list, right? The way you think of it is, is associations, right? You think of uh, what food you ate and that's connected to something else and that's connected to something else and so on. So it's a really powerful paradigm for storing information. All right.
So let's write a program like 224. Let's count the number of times that different phrases in your input file occur. So you remember this assignment? It was Did evil. Your input? Hmm? It was evil. It was evil. Um, break your input into phrases, right, with punctuation and so on. Just count how many times each phrase occurs. Um, so let's let's write some pseudocode. While null is not equal to phrase equals next phrase. So next phrase is one of these routines that we've written that breaks your input into phrases. It ignores punctuation, it converts to uppercase, all that stuff, right? So phrase is the next phrase in our input. And we're going to go through a loop until we hit the end of the file. All right, before I do that, I'm going to write a pair of routines that use this hash function to create an associative array. So here's my two routines. Fetch key and it returns an integer. And this returns the integer stored at array bracket key, where key is a string. So if I say fetch Nick, it would fetch Nick's phone number. If I say fetch Izad, it would fetch Izad's phone number. But I'm not going to store phone numbers in this array. I'm just storing plain old integers. So fetch retrieves something that's stored. The flip side of that is store key comma value. And that says save value at array bracket. So if I say store nick comma five, and then I say fetch nick, it should give me back a five. And those two routines, trivial to implement with a hash. Right? Take your key, hash it to an index, read what's at that index. Or take your key, hash it to an index, and store your value at that index in the array. Should you be passing the actual array into it too? Or? No, it's magic is happening somewhere. Right. So. No collisions, the array is already known somewhere it's being maintained. So just a pseudocodish interface. Okay. All right, so how do I count the number of times that my phrases occur? Store phrase, comma, one plus fetch phrase. In the program. So get a phrase, use my fetch to see how many times that phrase has already been found, and if it isn't in my array, it'll return a zero. Add one to that, and then store that in my array associated with the word phrase. So now, you get the phrase, hello, Nick, and that hashes to, I don't know, five, so that gets stored down here. So when I fetch, hello, Nick, it'll bring up a zero, because it's not found. It'll add one, which is a one, and it'll say store one at this phrase. It puts a one right there. When you say, this is fun, well, that hashes to, I don't know, 17, and there's nothing stored in there right now, so fetch, this is fun, returns a zero, add one is one, store that at the index, this is fun, so there's a one. And then you see the phrase again, hello, Nick, and that hashes to this location, so fetch, hello, Nick, returns a one, add one is two, store that at the index given by hello, Nick. And now it's telling you you've seen Hello Nick twice. And at the end of all your input, your hash table has the number of times each phrase occurs. All right, making some sense? 
Let's talk about details. Let's talk about this issue of collisions, because this is inevitable. So let's do a simplified hash table. Let's just store integers. So store integers in an array <coughs> of length 7. Oh, heck, I'll be lazy. I'll do 5. I'll do 10. All right, so here's our array. is going to be I'm just going to take the number we're storing and reduce it modulo 10. Very simple function. All right. Let me put down some indexes. So let's store 237. So where does that get stored? Index 7. There's our 237. Let's store 15. That's going to get stored right here. Let's store 17. 17 should get stored at index 7. Okay, we need a way to observe that there's already something in location 7. So first of all, we're going to need some field over here, which I'm going to call valid. And all of these are going to get initialized to zero. And valid bit's going to get set when we have something in that spot. Because there's no such thing as an empty spot in the array. We can't actually say there's nothing in there. So we'll use a flag for that. And this is the data. All right, what do we do? We want to store it at 7, and 7 is already in use. There's a few options. Um, first option store it in the next location. Seven's in use, we'll just store it in the next spot. Store 27. Should go right here. That's in use. We'll put it here instead. That's in use. We'll put it down here. Store 1007. That's in use. That's in use. That's in use. Let's try this one. That one works. So wrap around at the bottom. All right. Um, that's simple to do, but it's not terribly efficient. Because if lots of things point to 7, lots of things are going to get clustered up there. And this is an inefficiency. So suppose we want to look for 27. Well, we take 27, we hash it, it comes down here. This is not equal to 27. But we don't know yet that 27 is not in our table. Because if we tried to store a 27 after this was already in use, 27 would have gotten stored somewhere else. So we've got to check the next location. That's not 27 either, but if this got stored before a 27, it's possible 27 got stored after. So we check the next location. There's 27. Yes, we found it in the table. But it took us three operations instead of one. All right, so look for 97. It wants to hash here. That's not a 97. That's not a 97. That's not a 97. That's not a 97. This location is empty. Now we can say 97 is not on the table. We still don't have to check every location, but we had to check until we either found it or we get an empty spot. We should have been changed to valid. What if every spot was used by something? If every spot is used by something, you end up checking every single spot. So a full hash table is not your friend. A well-designed hash table will not get very full. 
you want enough space in there that it's going to be more empty than not because it kills your performance. But if a hash table is completely full, inevitably it's long to search for things and it's impossible to insert anything new. So this is sometimes called linear probing. It's, it's very straightforward, but it's not terribly efficient. Here's an alternative. We add a second number here. which we'll call a probe. And probe is the attempt number. Let's say it starts with one. So probe says, how many times have you tried to store this number in your hash table, or this key in your hash table? So let's go back here where we just had these, let's get rid of, we'll keep 15, 17, and we'll just keep those first two, 237 and 15. All right, we modify our hash function. And let's say instead of just returning n, we'll return um, n times probe <coughs> modulo 13. All right, so if probe equals 1, that's our first attempt. We're just returning n mod, why did I do 13, 10? Our first attempt, probe equals 1, we're just returning n mod 10. If that gives us a collision, so we want to store 17. 17 should put us right here, that's a collision. So now we call our hash function again with a probe value of two. So hash of 17 comma one equals seven, that gives us a collision. So now we try hash of 17 comma 2. So 17 times 2 is 34. 34 mod 10 is a 4. That's open. And so we'll store our 17 right here. Now if we want to store 27, well, first hash is going to take us to location 7. The second hash is going to take us to 27 times 2 is 54. That would take us here. That's going to be a collision too. So hash of 27 comma 1 equals 7. Hash of 27 comma 2 equals 4. And those are both collisions. Hash of 27 comma 3 is going to be a 1, 81. And that's open, so we'll store our 27 here. Now we want to search for a piece of data, let's search for 237, just do the same thing in reverse. 237 maps here, we're done. Search for a 17, we look here, that's not a 17. Calculate the hash value with a probe of two, that's a four, there it is. So now we want to search for um, something that's not in there, like a 37. So our first probe will take us here, our second probe will take us here, our third probe will take us here. Our fourth probe will take us down to location eight, and it's not found there. This is not a really great choice of hash function that I've used, right? Because we still seem to be getting a lot of collisions. It's basically just based on the last digit. And this probe function um, isn't terribly clever. Now, if I had done something like, um, like the following, uh, probe equals one, just do n mod 10, probe equals 2, let's do n squared mod 10, probe <coughs> equals 3, let's do n cubed mod 10. Um, that's not going to be any better, actually. 10 is an awful choice for a table size. So let me try to give you a better function. Um, So hash of 
17 comma 1 would be 7. Hash of 27 comma 1 would be 7 again. Hash of 27 comma 2 would be whatever 2 to the 27th is mod 10. I don't want to figure out what that number is, but it's not going to be 7. And if I try to hash 37, it's going to take me somewhere different. So you'd like your, your hash function to spread things out. Just out of curiosity, if we were to take the same algorithm, the, you know, mod 10 and everything like that, but instead declare an array of like 100 and then just uh, say if it comes out uh, to be, a, it ends in a 7, um, then you go to uh, element 70 and start there and just put all the any, things ending in 7 in one of the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, or things ending in 9 in one of the 90s. Yeah, that kind of thing. you can do that too. And if you expect lots of data to end in one particular digit, that's not going to be a really good approach, right? Because you're still going to get this clustering. And ideally, you'd like your hash function to spread things out throughout your table. And if you have collisions, you'd like it to resolve those in places that are spread out. So um, let's say you want to store a student ID. calculated modulo 100, that's not a bad function, right? Just picking off the last two digits, that's not too bad. If instead you have take the first two digits, that's a horrible hash function. Right? Everyone's going to go to 94. So if you understand something about the nature of the data, that can help you pick a better hash function. Um, So that's another factor. For various reasons, we usually make hash tables have a length that's a prime number. Because here's another way to do probing. Back in the day, it used to be really easy to embed geographic information in the phone numbers because when everyone had landlines, you yeah. had like prefixes by neighborhoods yep. and all that kind of stuff. It was really easy to find stuff. Yeah. And for a long time, you couldn't port a phone number to a different part of the country. Yeah. They'd give you like 30 days to switch and then they cut you off because it was a real nightmare, I think, to maintain that housekeeping. Some parts of the country still have like the, uh, the long distance is built by the prefix and everything. Really? Like that. Yeah, like if it's more than a couple miles away, they're going to charge you X more cents a minute. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I don't know why anyone uses it. I know. <laughs> So, um, so another option is, is 17 goes to 7. Okay, 27 goes to 7. Um, if that's a collision, let's just map it to 14, which is the same as 4. Right, so just whatever this is, jump up by that amount to find another location. And a lot of these collision techniques use that. Um, if this has a length of 10, and your hash maps to an index of 5. You're going to try location 5, and if that's busy, you're going to add 5, which will take you to 10, which takes you back to 0. And if that's also occupied, you're going to add another 5, and it's going to take you back to 5. And you've only tried two locations. OK, you can avoid that by making this table length prime. Basically, if your stride, the amount that you're going to use to go down in your table, is relatively prime to a table length, they're guaranteed to try every single location. So making the table length prime is the easiest way to do that. So you don't see tables with lengths of 10, you'd see 11 or 13 or 101. So there's a variety of ways you can do this. Probing is, is the general term. Totally different approach to handling collisions is called chaining. And the idea there, Thank you. 
take the first number you want to store at 237. So we would associate that to this, but instead of storing it right here, make this a sentinel node and create a linked list. And put your 237 there. And when you want to store your 15, put that right here in the beginning of a linked list. And now when you want to store a 27, come down here, go to the end of this list, and store your 27. And so the entries of your hash are sentinel nodes. And they each point to a linked list containing all the pieces of data that were stored associated with that index by the hash function. That's got pros and cons over probing. Right, relatively easy to implement, and it can grow indefinitely up to the limit of the operating system storage if you use PA2 style linked lists. Right, we can have a million things that all hash to seven, and we just get a really long linked list with a corresponding decrease in efficiency. Because searching a linked list is inefficient, but we're not inherently bound by only having 10 entries. The more entries we have, hopefully the fewer collisions and the more efficiency. But the amount of data is essentially unlimited. So that's called chaining. back to our cheap hash function. Here's our valid bit. Here's our data. and we'll just do modulo 10 for our hash function. So let's store uh, 15, so that goes right there. Let's store 17, that goes right here. Let's store 27, and we'll just use straight linear probing, so we'll just store the 27 in the next spot. So these are valid. very quiet in the room or something very loud underneath the concrete floor. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're on top of everything. HVAC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's probably the safest place to be if there is an explosion downstairs because it's all just like concrete. <laughs> Maybe. Okay, stop. Um, so basic hash function just mod 10 so we get we get these collisions. Okay. Um, Look for 27. Straightforward, 27 hashes to a 7. We check index 7. That's not a 27, but there is something there. So we have to check the next location, and there's our 27. OK, what happens when we delete? So it finds a 27. OK, delete 17. So run 17 through your hash function, we get index 7. We look at index 7, and there's the 17 that we're trying to delete. So what do we do? We change the valid bit to a 0. So far, so good. Now, if we look for a 27, 27 hash to 7, we check index 7. That's not a 27. And in fact, there's nothing stored there. 
our assumption has been, therefore 27 is not in our table. Because since this is empty, if there is a 27, it should be stored there. The problem is there was something stored there before we stored the 27 and then we deleted it. So we got to have another flag here, which we'll call deleted. So go back in time when we had the 17. When we delete the 17, we not only change the valid bit to a zero, but we set this flag. To let us know that there was something there, and even though there's nothing there anymore, there may have been something there that caused a collision. So now we look for a 27, it hashes a 7, we check this is not a 27, it's not valid, but something got deleted. We treat that the same way as if we had found something here, and we say, okay, let's check the next location, and in this case we find a 27. Now if I store uh, 417, 417 hashes to location 7, I check location 7, it's not in use. So I can store my 417 right here. I have to do two things. I have to say this is valid, and I have to say it's not a deleted entry anymore. And now again, if I look for a 27, I'll check location 7 first. It won't match 27, but the valid bit is set meaning there's some piece of data in there and it's not deleted. So that'll force me to go on and check the next location, which is eight in this case, and I'll find my 27. So we really need three pieces of data in each entry in this array. We need the actual data we're storing. We need a bit which tells us whether or not the data that we find there is actual data. In other words, is there actually something we stored there? And we need another flag which says even though there's nothing valid in here, there used to be, and it was deleted. And we have to pay attention to both of those latter two flags when we're searching and inserting. So it's a little bit of a complication, but nothing too horrible. Question is yes. Uh, I just have a quick question. Mm -hmm. For inserting the 417, because we have that deleted entry and then we also have the 27 right after it. So you have to scan through all the possible candidates before you... So let's see, we deleted the 17. So, yeah. Um, yeah, before you insert anything, you're going to have to make sure it's not in there if you don't want duplicates. Um, even if there's not a collision. Yeah, so good point, thanks. Um, I'm assuming that we've already decided there's no 417, and so we want to insert 417 fresh. So that'll come down. So let's throw that in here and look for 417. So 417 hashes to a seven. We check this is not 417. Right, there's nothing in here, but something was here and was deleted. So if there's a 417, it might have been stored after this. So we go on to the next location, there's a 27. That's valid, but it's not 417. Got to check the next location. That's not valid and not deleted, so we know 417 is not in there. And then if we go ahead and insert it, that'll come right here. It's not deleted, and it's valid. How do you write something like this? It's really not too bad if you do it in pieces. Certainly one part of it is the hash function itself. And for an assignment, you're going to be given what the hash function should be. And generally, it's going to be a hash function that takes not only the thing you're trying to hash, but an attempt number, a probe number. And for different probe numbers, it should give you different values back. That's the theory, at least. 
So when you want to store something, we'll write out this pseudocode in detail on Wednesday. When you want to store something, what do you do? You basically take the thing, you hash it with a probe number of one, and you check your array to see if that spot's available. If it is, you store it there and you're done. If that spot is not valid and deleted, you can store it in that spot. Right? Basically, if valid is zero, you know it's not being used. You can clear the deleted flag, set the valid flag, store your data. If that spot is in use, it's valid if it is set, then you rehash your key with a probe of two. Gives you a different number. And you do the same thing. You check that spot in your array, see if it's available. If it's not, you rehash your function with a probe of three. Right? The probe is the attempt number. Third attempt, hash key, comma three. If that's not available, call your hash with a probe of four. Eventually, one of two things happen. You get to an index that's available, in which case you store it, you set the valid bit, you make sure the deleted flag is clear, and you're done. Or you've tried so many locations that you've concluded your table is full. And the easiest way to do that is just count how many times you're probing. So if you've got 10 entries in your array and you try hashing 10 times and you haven't been able to store it, you're not going to be able to store it. Right? Assuming your probe function, was, your hash function was written well. So you just count and that tells you that your table is full. Or you can keep track of how many things are in your um, table and if there's no space left, just refuse to store anything. There's different approaches. So storing is, is that. Deleting something is kind of like storing. Take your key, hash it with a probe of one. If you find the data in the table and it's valid, clear the valid, set the delete. If you don't find your data in the table but the valid bit is set, or the valid bit is clear and the delete is set, you gotta try probing again. So use your hash function on your key with a probe of two, that gives you a new location and keep going. If it doesn't match your data and it's set to be invalid but it's deleted, or it's valid, do another probe. And eventually you either find your data to delete in which case you just clear valid, set deleted, or you run out of spots, in which case, you, or you get to a spot that's not valid and not deleted, in which case you say data's not in there. And then search is the same thing without the delete piece. Keep probing, if you find the data, it's found. If you get to a spot that's not valid and not deleted, it's not found. If you get to a spot that's valid, you keep searching. If you get to a spot that's not valid and deleted, you keep searching. So we can write some pseudocode out for that on Wednesday and talk about some of the details and some different hash functions. Um, questions on this? I have a question on OVP9. Cool. Um, the buffer character array, mm -hmm. is that going to be passed in as a string? It's a character array. Character array. That's the same thing as a string. See, there is no such thing as a string. Okay. Right. I, I was just wondering if it's null terminated or not. Yes. Okay. Yeah, in that sense, it is a string. It's null terminated. Okay. So you can use string length to see how many characters are in there, or you can search up to the null terminator. Yeah. Yeah, there are things in C that are strings, I guess. There's just no type that's yeah. a string. But yeah, it's null terminated. A word of warning, if you write this and you're testing it with your own main program and you're using fgets, keep in mind that fgets throws a new line at the end of your string. So if you say fgets buffer and you type in abc enter and then you pass buffer to your hash function, you're actually trying to hash abc new line. And it's not going to give you the same value as my code when you hash abc. So don't get tripped up by that if all your numbers are off by 10, modulo 13. It's because you're picking up a new line at the end. That doesn't affect your function itself. It's just your main program you can throw a red herring like that.
other questions? No PA2 questions? I'm not yet at probably one day. Okay. <laughs>